So we'll just wait for all the people to come in. Mm -hmm. We're up to about 70 now. <gasps> just watching them all pop in. Hundred. Okay, I think um, we're a couple of minutes past seven. We're up to a hundred. Possibly more will come in. Um, hopefully, everybody keeps themselves on mute. So I think we'll get going. Um, hello, and thank you for joining us. I thought it was great that it's on International Women's Day. It just does seem really appropriate. Um, we're focusing on the menopause and perimenopause and the impact it can have on women's participation in sport, especially cycling, and discovering some of the strategies that may be helpful. I'm your chair. I'm Fiona Outdoors, uh, possibly better known as well, I'm Fiona Russell, actually, I've just called myself Fiona Outdoors, but I'm better known as Fiona Outdoors. I tend to call myself that. I'm a journalist and a blogger and love sport and the great outdoors. Um, and I've been writing about the menopause more recently and how it's affected me with my sport and other women. And we've got a great line of, uh, lineup for our panel this evening. We've got five on our panel. I thought I'd give you a quick introduction of each of them. So Joyce McKellar is a Scottish cycling board member. She is the retired CEO of Renfrewshire Leisure and Culture Trust and spent 25 years in management in the local government, leisure and culture sector. She's a former national level, level swimmer and she's been cycling for fitness and fun for about 14 years. Her menopause started shortly after return from cycling Land's End to John O'Groats, quite appropriately, some seven years ago and in her early 50s. Joyce will talk about this during the discussion. Stephanie Kershaw Marsh joins us from the organization Menopause Support. A former nurse with many years of experience, she originally joined the Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps and subsequently qualified as a reg registered general nurse. Aged 41, Steph and her partner bought a yacht and sailed off into the sunset for nine years. It sounds idyllic, doesn't it? But she says it was not as glamorous as it sounds. About five years into living an idyllic off-grid lifestyle, she started to develop what she now knows to be the symptoms of perimenopause. She describes losing her joy in her life and despite her surroundings felt irritable and argumentative, angry, short-tempered and experienced se severe menstrual flooding, which will be familiar to many people. Steph was initially refused HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy and told she was too young to be menopausal at the age of 49. Having done her own research, she returned to the UK and found a GP who was more up to date and happy to prescribe for her. Steph is a valued member of the moderating team on the private Facebook group, Menopause Support, which is an excellent resource, actually, if anybody wants to join that, and I'll be giving details later. She's been in increasing her medical menopause knowledge and aims to share factual, evidence-based information to enable women to make informed decisions about their health and to access the care and support they deserve, and it really is an excellent forum. Vicky Begg is head, co head coach at Glasgow Triathlon Club and offers sports coaching and psychology of sport counselling services to private clients. Cycling and triathlon have been a major part of her life since she was 17. Over the decades, Vicky has been a very high achieving amateur athlete, athlete and most notably won the World Age Group Triathlon Championships in the sprint distance race in 2008, which is a great achievement. In the past 10 to 12 years, her competitive edge has waned and she, although actually she does still win all the races locally, she's turned more to coaching, tutoring and volunteering. She's a level three triathlon coach. Her special interest in menopause and sport came while studying for an MSc in psychology of sport, 2016 to 18 at the University of Stirling. Vicky describes herself as entering the first phases of perimenopause. Fiona Walker is a cyclist and coach. She's been a cycle racing and organizing and, and has been organizing races for 30 years. She's a member of the Scottish Cycling Women's Development Group and has a long association with Scottish Cycling, including previously being on the board and employed as a regional development officer. She has also previously worked as a GP, although over 10 years ago, and so she has some experience of treating patients at this stage of their life. She's been perimenopausal for about three years, and she'll tell us more about this later. And Chris Kumari was born in Africa, raised in London, spent time in Dubai, and now lives in Scotland. 
She fell into the world of cycling after being persuaded to enter a three-day women's charity cycle challenge from London to Paris in 2018. And in non-COVID times, she continues to participate in cycling events. She's a registered performance nutritionist, an SEN school PE coach and trained in bikeability as a cycle trainer. She's also extending her knowledge in sports and exercise science and medicine, and medicine at Glasgow Uni. Kerry is postmenopausal by three years and said her knowledge of nutrition helped her to cope with her menopause by enabling her to adapt her diet to cope with the physical effects. She'll also be telling us more about this later. So let's start. Well, welcome everyone onto the panel. Thanks so much for giving us your time. First, let's find out what the menopause is exactly. Over to Stephanie for that. Hi, um, right, the, the medical definition of the menopause is actually 12 months without a menstrual period. That's the point at which you can say that you are menopausal. The years leading up to that point are known as perimenopause and the years post that one day, 12 months since your last period are called postmenopause. What's happening in that time is that at the point of menopause, our ovaries are no longer producing sufficient estrogen in order to be able to function properly. So um, in the years leading up to that, our estrogen levels are um, declining, but they're fluctuating while they're declining. They're like on a downhill roller coaster, really. So you get ups and downs and normals at any time. Um, and that's it, really. It's, it's just the cessation of produ production of estrogen because we don't have any eggs left in our ovary. And what sort of age is this likely to occur? Sorry, yeah, the, uh, the average age in the Western world is 51. However, um, Early menopause is known as under 45, and um, is one in 100 women will have menopause below the age of 40, one in 1,000 below the age of 30, and one in 10,000 below the age of 20. So it's not unheard of for women to be menopausal in their 30s, in which case it's generally known as um, premature ovarian insufficiency. But many women say that they've suffered perimenopause and menopause symptoms for somewhere around about 10 years. I think that's right, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, it could yeah. go on for two years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of symptoms. Um, the list of symptoms is extensive and probably far more than many people may think about as menopausal issues. I mean, you might, for example, already know about the hot flushes. That's fairly common and well known. Uh, heavier and more irregular periods. I mean, actually, you get very hot when you're stressed. <laughs> So I'm feeling a little bit hot just now and uh, weight gain. There, but there are many, many more symptoms. And these include, for example, muscle cramps, not just the sort of abs, the stomach ones that you might experience with periods, but muscle cramps all over your body, joint pain, migraines, anxiety, irritability, depression, insomnia, hair loss, breast cysts, reduced libido, brain fog, memory loss, mood swings, itchy skin, cold flushes, which are actually like the hot flushes, except you feel very chilled to the bone, and postmenopause osteoporosis, which is brittle bones. I mean, that's not even the full list, but that's just an example of the many different types of symptoms that you can have. And of course, there are also these symptoms that might affect your sport. So let's uh, speak to Stephanie again about the physical issues relating to taking part in sport that could be caused by peri or menopause. Of many of the cells in the body have an estrogen receptor on them and that means that they need estrogen in order to be able to function at their optimum level. As we start to lose that estrogen, we, um, those cells don't get that estrogen anymore and therefore they can no longer function optimally and we experience symptoms. Probably some of the ones that are most likely to affect um, sports are the loss of muscle mass, uh, uh, muscular aches and pains, fatigue as you've already mentioned, but also the genitourinary syndrome of menopause which is probably quite pertinent for cyclists. The whole of the pelvic area is very dependent on estrogen for its normal function. And as we lose that, then the vagina becomes, the walls of the vagina become much thinner and less able to produce mucus, therefore they become dry. And um, apart from that, you also get changes to the labia, the skin can shrink and it can split very, very easily, it can, can become paper thin. And there can also be bladder problems, so there could be continence issues as well. Um, the, these things are all very easily treated with some estrogen, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Yeah, and actually I wanted to say as well, if people have got questions, they should pop them into the Q&A box system um, and we can deal with those later. 
Um, so also, as well as um, the physical issues, there's um, many women to a lesser or greater extent um, also find their mental health can be affected. And of course, this really will be important in sport. So let's hand over to Vicky here to talk about more of the mental health issues um, that many, many women do experience in perimenopause and menopause phase. Hi, yes, thanks Fiona. Um, if, if, we, if we begin with the, the notion that, that ageing is, is a fact and a, and a factor for everyone, I think it's something that helps to give us a, a, an initial sense of togetherness. And it happens to, to women, men and, and any athletes, to be honest. Um, if uh, you take a look at those people who are around about you and if you're usually in, let's say, a, a, a sporty circle of friends or you're in an environment such as a club, Take a look at the people around about you who are actually aging with you. I think that's one good factor to help you with your sort of mental health progress in terms of the aging progress. Um, I did want to sort of point out initially that that for some people, this this aging phase actually comes with amazing opportunities. So we will go positive as well as as well as hit on some of the negative sort of um, aspects as well. Some women find that they actually have greater opportunities in this phase in relative terms as compared to when they were younger. So it can actually be a really nice phase of your life. Um, um, for women who find themselves with, for example, different or more free time, um, perhaps because their children have moved on or because their children are doing different things, it does mean that they're actually able to um, get involved in a little bit more sport and this actually helps you feel better about yourself in some ways and helps you feel better about your sporting achievements. Mm. I think another thing um, to, to sort of think about is that um, you might start to make some uh, social comparisons, you might worry about how you're looking, what your self-image is um, and, and these sorts of things can be a really crippling barrier to participation. And this might be one of the areas that we start to talk about a little bit more later on. So finding a sort of form of, I don't know, sort of togetherness, social cohesion, community based activities can be a really helpful way of, of getting yourself through the, the sort of psychological um, issues that, that you might be encountering. Find a kind of non-judgmental um, group of people or a club where everything's valued fairly similarly. Um, so the type of athlete and the type of achievement doesn't really matter. It's just that your achievement and, and your participation is really what, what matters. Um, I think that's a sort of a, a good initial starting yeah. point, really. Yeah, I mean, there's a sort of coming to terms with... Um sometimes that you might feel less able, you've not been able to achieve as you used to, you're comparing yourself to before. Um, and many people talk about feeling low motivation or stressed or anxious um, as they go into this phase. But it, as Vicky says, there are methods and, and ways to help you to combat that. But it, it to just to remember that lots and lots of women at this stage do feel like that. And motivation can be a really big thing in that, you know, you just don't feel like it, you feel too tired. And then you feel like you've put on weight and then your Im body image is affected and then your confidence is affected and all these things, as well as the physical side of things, there is the mental side of things as well. So uh, perimenopause does affect us all differently, um, but it could be that perhaps sporty women tend to be more in tune with their prior capabilities and what they were able to achieve. And then the change in hormones and their physique affects their performance, um, both mentally and physically. So to put some of this into perspective, a couple of our panelists will tell us about how the peri and menopause has affected them. And I also wanted to give you a brief overview um, as the chair, I don't really want to bang on too much, but it quite pertinent to this discussion is how um, I discovered that I was in perimenopause and this was in my early forties. I had not even heard of the word perimenopause. And in fact, I thought menopause was just simply the cessation of my periods and I'd, I'd go on gay. I started suffering from severe cramps and they were in my feet and my hat and my legs and they woke me up at night um i'd end up with spasms in my abs my shoulders and my hands too and it actually put me off exercising and stopped me swimming i was a very keen triathlete if i cycled and ran i would be stopped by these horrendous cramps and i started to wonder about why it was and i did my own research 
and I still couldn't fathom it. And so I went to the doctors and they sent me to the consultant at hospital, not, um, it wasn't anything to do with the menopause. They were checking me out for Parkinson's and other neurological issues, which was pretty worrying. So I did further research and I came across a few forums, um, American forums actually at the time on the menopause and lots of women were complaining about uh, cramps in their feet at night. And I thought, well, I wonder if that's just worse for me, maybe it is. Um, and so I asked my GP, who was a good GP actually, who listened if I could try HRT. So I thought, well, if I sort out some of my hormones, perhaps, even though I'm only in my early 40s, I can't possibly be menopausal, I thought, but I'll give HRT a try. And actually, it cured the cramps within weeks. And then as an um, outcome of that, I realized that it was also curing my migraines, my itchy skin, my anxiety, my depression, my UTIs, which I hadn't realized I was suffering because I was in the early stages of menopause. But also, let's hear from some other people about their um, case, their examples of the perimenopause, because it does help other people to realize that they're not all, that we're all in the same situation. So Joyce, you tell us about how, what it was like for you, what it is like for you. Okay, thank you, Fiona. Um, first of all, the perimenopausal stage, I think for myself, was a, a kind of, it went by in a blur because I didn't know what I was going through. I was at, I would, as I said, I was in a senior management position within local government and there just suddenly started to have these kind of brain fogs. I would be quite anxious about things I hadn't been before and never really kind of added up together because I, like many women, nobody really talked about the menopause before. So I wasn't, I wasn't knowing what was happening to me. I just thought I was going through a really stressful time at work and I suddenly couldn't cope. You know, my only way of coping was actually going out in my bike. And then I did the Land's End to John O'Groat cycle with two other friends, came back. And then I started getting hit by um, what I now know is the full menopause because I hadn't had a period for a year and I went into full menopause at the end of this. And that was the hot sweats, which led to night times of getting up and changing your night dress, changing sheets, lack of sleep. And the lack of sleep meant you couldn't then exercise because you were too tired to exercise. I couldn't think properly at work. I would start um, shouting at people for no reason or I would be sitting wanting to cry for no reason. Though Somebody who'd been very much in control, both at work, at home and at um, exercise, suddenly I couldn't cope with anything. It was just horrendous. I tried speaking to, to, to get medical advice and to, to talk about HRT, which I'd read a lot about. I had no contraindicator, so I thought it would be nothing easier than to go to the doctor and they would say, yeah, you can have HRT. It took me 18 months to get somebody to listen to me. But eventually I did go on HRT, but I was at that time then 55. And the doctor said he would only allow me to stay on it until I was um, 60. And I said, well, even if it gets me through to retire at 67, I'll stay on it for those three years, which I did. And it was fantastic. It was great. It was like a new lease of life. But then I had to bring myself off it. And to do that, I had to look at other alternatives. But in the meantime, you were still having things like no, not being able to, as Vicky will know, Vicky's a, a cyclist and has I've cycled alongside her. No, you, you suddenly can't get up the hills because you've got no energy. You've got no, your muscles are changed. You're carrying more weight. And if you're trying to get up a hill, the last thing you need is more weight around your middle on a bike. So it was things like that that started to make me realise that, no, this was a, a serious thing and that we needed to start to make sure that other people understood what you were going through. I think every symptom that you talk about, you know, whether it was itchy skin, sweats, mental issues all of these things I think you have you have it all most people have it all and people say you should talk to your mother because for how they took it, uh, dealt with it is probably how you will my mom said oh I never did anything it was fine I was fine I just went through the change without any problem so I kept thinking well there must be something really wrong with me if I've got all these symptoms and my mom didn't have them but certainly I'm probably now coming to the, the end of mine but that's 10 it's a 10 year journey virtually to, to the end which is quite scary because I think when you finish your period you think oh yes great life's going to be wonderful but then somebody says oh this can last for up to 10 years and you're like no way but it, it can it's a journey you have to learn to live with it but you have to also I think make sure that you talk to people about it and that will help all these things and all these symptoms. Thank you so much yes that's I mean very common and I hear this from a lot of women the same sort of thing um, and also we're going to hear from Fiona Walker um, you tell us a bit more about your journey, as it were, or your journey so far. Yeah, so I'm perimenopausal and I probably have been for about three years. But for the first year, because I was only sort of 42 at the time, I wasn't really 
aware that that was what was happening. My periods got really quite irregular and unpredictable, um, which, as all of you who are cyclists will know, there's nothing worse than getting your period when you're out on your bike, when you're not expecting it. Um, so, but I didn't do anything about it at the time because I just put up with it. And the other thing that I got then that I hadn't really realised was part of it was I got recurrent saddle sores, which I'd never really had before. I'd had the odd one, but I'd been cycling most of my life. And, you know, it was, it was a new thing getting them all the time. And it was only about a year after that when the hot flushes started that I thought, oh, this is, this is what's going on. And at that point, I didn't have a period for three months. So I went to my GP, not because the hot flushes were that bad at the time, but I was really quite worried about osteoporosis. Um, so my bloods were all done. I've had osteopenia in the past, so hence my worry about my bones. And she checked my calcium, my hormones, they were all normal. So I just got on with it. But the irregular periods got worse. And I had a stage where I went a couple of months of having a period every two weeks. So I basically I had a period for a week. Then the next week I had all sorts of premenstrual symptoms. And then I had a period for a week. And this went on for a couple of months. And then I'd go a couple of months without. And then, then the hot flushes got really bad to a point where I was at work and it would be jump it on, jump it off, jump it on, jump it off couldn't get to sleep at night because it was just really bad oh I missed a step there dealing with the heavy periods and the regular periods I went back to my GP she was great and I got a marina coil fitted which meant although the periods were still irregular they were so light I didn't notice them and then say the hot flushes got really bad about a year ago and I'm like, I must go to GP, I must go to GP. And then, of course, COVID happened and everything closed down. So hot flushes at home doing nothing wasn't so much of an issue. But then when I went back to work in September, I was having to wear a face mask. And a hot flush and a face mask is not fun. So went to my GP um, and I got estrogen patches. Because I don't, I've already got the progesterone in the marina. And that just, within a month, no more hot flushes. I've only had one saddle sore since I started HRT, which has been on for about five months now. And yeah, I'm, I'm back to who I was before. I know it'll be some time before my periods actually stop, probably. But I think the thing that I take from this was, started a lot earlier than I expected I knew that you could get a couple of years before your period started being like this I hadn't really expected it to start in my early 40s yeah I think that's quite common um, and we're going to go on to talking about HRT because lots of people listening won't really know what HRT is hormone replacement therapy they won't understand what a marina coil is I mean when you're in the middle of it you kind of know all the terms so um, it's important to look at um, the things that we can do. So there's a growing body of evidence to show the benefits of HRT. It used to be a no-no um, 10, 20 years ago, we were told we couldn't have it. Um, or if we did have it, we'd have a much greater increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, evidence and research has shown that that is not exactly the case. Yes, there is a slight increased risk of breast cancer, but in fact, there are many other benefits. Um, and there's also many women looking towards testosterone replacement now as well. There's been greater bodies of research into testosterone because women also uh, have reduced testosterone and that can affect also our, um, our bodies very much like estrogen can from what I read. Um, but of course, this isn't for everyone. HRT is not for everybody and some people's medical history precludes them from this course of action. So there are other women who find they use alternative methods to help and we're going to talk further about that. But first of all, let's ask Stephanie to tell us about HRT. What are the pros and cons? And perhaps if you know anything about testosterone. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, um, so HRT is basically repl hormone replacement therapy. So you're basically replacing the estrogen and the progesterone that we are leaving, losing. 
Um, estrogen is replaced to treat the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, and progesterone is replaced to protect the uterus. So if someone's had a hysterectomy, then uh, in most cases, in almost all cases, they don't need to have progesterone, they can just have the estrogen. Um, modern HRT is plant-based, it's sourced from wild yams and soy, uh, and it's taken to the laboratory and they synthesize a 17 beta estradiol, which is the active ingredient. This is the same molecular structure as the estrogen that is produced in our bodies, so that our brains are, you know, they're, they're none the wiser, basically. Um, there's several different ways of having um, estrogen. You can either have it via tablet form, patch, gel, or spray. Uh, the transdermal methods, so patch, gel, or spray, are considered to have the least risk. The um, tablet form has a slight risk, slight increased risk of venous thromboembolism, so blood clots in the heart and, and lungs, potentially. Uh, the um, progesterone is available in several, several different um, formulations as well. There are the progestogens, which are entirely synthetic man-made sub um, substances, which are available in uh, tablet form, or they're available as part of the combined patch with estrogen and progesterone progesterone, progestogen, sorry, progestogen, um, or there is progesterone, which is uh, synthesized again from wild yams and soy, micronized progesterone, that's available as a tablet form as well. Um, HRT is known to protect, as we've already said, against osteoporosis. It helps to with the, the matrix of the bone as opposed to the building blocks of the bone. It's also known to protect against heart disease. Um, so it helps to stop the, um, the plaques forming, which clog up our arteries and make our arteries hardened and narrowed. So it's known to help with that. And there's also emerging evidence to say that it does help it to um, prevent Alzheimer's disease as well. Lots of research going on about estrogen's positive effects. And um, there are some cons, obviously. Not everyone gets on with progesterone. If progesterone is the hormone which normally causes PMT. So the typical side effects of progesterone are PMT-like side effects. Um, and uh, there's also a condition known as premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, um, which some women react to progesterone in this way, and they, and they find it very, very difficult to get a, an HRT that really suits them. So it's not for everybody. They, there are you know, other options available as well, but estrogen is the one that does treat all of the symptoms as well as, as give the, um, the protections as well. Testosterone, according to the current research and evidence-based NICE guidance, is only prescribable for low libido. There is some anecdotal evidence to say that it is also helpful for fatigue and joint and muscle pains and for brain fog. But the research at the, at currently only says that it's, it's prescribable for, for lowered libido. That's brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so yes, I mean, it does, it does form a great solution for some women, um, but, but not for everybody. Um, for example, Joyce, uh, I think you used alternative remedies to cope, didn't you? Yeah, I did originally take HRT and I was on the estrogen patches, but my doctor seemed to be really anxious about me being on them for any length of time. So probably gave me a bit of fear about it. So when I retired from work, I decided to come off the patches and try and find alternative ways of dealing with the, the symptoms, which I still, which came back. As soon as you come off the patches, you get back to having all the hot sweats and all the moods. I thought you would run it out basically, but it doesn't just delays it for you. So I started looking and talking to actually the pharmacist in the, the local pharmacy, who was very helpful and suggested to me that I try things like evening primrose oil and vitamin B6, which would help me because most of mine was by then the hot flushes and the mood swings were the two main things that were, start, that were still really bothering me. So both of those have worked really well. I've now been taking those for about a year and a half and um, will continue, I think, to take them for about another six months because by that time I should be over most of it, but there gets a fear to let go, I think that's the, the problem, but both of them, and I have also looked at my diet. I have cut out caffeine um, from there. I try not to drink to excess in any way at all again, and I think just a uh, hot and spicy food. So you, you learn what kicks it off and if you do decide to have a curry, you realise you're just going to have to live with the effects of it. So actually using the evening primrose oil and the B6, I would say vitamin B6 have been really, really helpful to me um, in, yeah. in dealing with how I've, I've managed to continue to cycle. I've managed to continue not to kill anybody in the process because <laughs> you do get to that stage. You think, ah, I'm going to get somebody. But I, I think the monster's gone, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I know there's a lot of um, lots and lots of ideas. I mean, on some of the Facebook forums, for example, the menopause 
support network and there's various other ones and there's lots of women trying lots of different things and they you know it's well worth having a look at them for example there's um growing evidence of cbd oil for anxiety yeah. and insomnia and that kind of thing but um most interestingly when i'm quite fascinated by this because i hadn't really thought about this too much um as a nutritionist chris used her knowledge to cope with the menopause symptoms i'm really interested to hear about how that worked or what people can do so over to you chris yeah, thank you, Fiona. Um, yeah, so for sure, as a non-HRT postmenopausal woman now for about six years and counting, um, I've really accepted that my body has changed, my physiology has changed, and it's going to function and respond differently now. So I have now tried to adapt uh, my exercise and my nutrition to support me accordingly. So some of the things that I've uh, sort of covered is like the everyday foundations for me has been choosing my carbs. I aim for those complex carbohydrate foods. Now, this is going to help me regulate these uh, blood sugar levels and also minimize those blood sugar fluctuations that I have perhaps throughout the day. So it's able to support and sustain those energy levels and also help enhance mood as well. And because of this decline, and in my case, the lack of estrogen, there is a tendency to become carb sensitive because the body changes how it processes carbs. Now, Secondly, I try to mind my gut, which is creating this gut environment with beneficial bacteria, uh, which is going to change at different points throughout our life stages. So how my gut and my beneficial bacteria was when I was an adolescent to now is going to be completely different. So there's also this uh, uh, evidence about this bi-directional link between the gut and the brain as well. So I include prebiotics, these non-digestible carbohydrates, these sort of fiber foods, and these are going to feed and fuel uh, the growth of that beneficial bacteria, the probiotics. Now, these guys are experts at breaking down dietary fiber. It's going to help foster that healthy, diverse gut. Also, these uh, beneficial uh, bacteria, they also produce serotonin, which is this mood-enhancing chemical, also B12 as well. So that's for energy. So I try to incorporate those foods as well. Nutrient-dense foods, try to avoid any form of nutrient depletion. I try to add and have add rainbow colors of fruit and vegetables because each color is going to have a different kind of property and a protective effect on the body. I also include spices, not too hot, but I love turmeric, cumin, ginger, and cinnamon. I have those in my foods as well. Um, in terms of cycling, uh, I, I love cycling in the summer, not so much in the winter, but I aim, if I can, to go out in the middle of the day when the sun decides to come out to try and get my dose of my vitamin D because those sun rays hitting my skin for 15 to 20 minutes, I know I'm going to get my dose of my vitamin D because vitamin D is going to help absorb the dietary calcium, which is going to help you know, with my bone health. Now, this is... Um, Nutrients work together. They work synergistically. So it's not one nutrient that's going to be responsible. Um, also, during the autumn and winter, I've relied on vitamin D fortified food sources, but these are insufficient to keep levels up. So I take a good quality vitamin D supplementation in the autumn and winter uh, and making sure if I have a tablet form that I have it with some healthy fats like oily fish, because that's going to help with the absorption so oily fish, again, is really good for brain health. So in terms of uh, exercise, my estrogen training, um, it really does become harder to build up muscle. So I've added weighted resistance training to help build muscle mass. So the whole idea is to build it and to hold on to it. Uh, cycling, a non-weight bearing sport, and having that lack of that protective effect of estrogen on the bone bone obviously becomes vulnerable, that bone mineral density we talked about declines, which means I need to think about a type of stimulus that's going to help me. And that is plyometrics has helped me to counteract this. So something that's not going to take me too long, I haven't got much time, five, 10 minutes, multi-directional work, such as jumps, squats, lunges, something that's really going to load the bones for that stimulation. Recovery also is very important. I need to give more time for my body to recover. It's going to take that much longer. 
also that much longer to lower that cortisol, also that much longer to that overall stress that's placed on your body. So pumping up that dietary protein, really important. I try to get enough protein as possible, space it out throughout the day. Also, it's going to help me minimize those blood sugar level fluctuations, going to help support my muscle, help my recovery process as well. So, you know, taking more protein, you need more protein to do the same job that you used to do before menopause. So I go for the three T's, which is timing, when I space out my frequency of my protein throughout the day, the total amount of protein I take, and also the type of protein I take. I also include protein late in the evening as well, before bed, for muscle maintenance, recovery, and for sleep. Uh, hydration is another one that's really important, keeping up with the hydration because the thirst perception reduces. So I sip water throughout the day and managing stress is a big one for me as well. So I try to reduce these high levels of stress. This increase of the hormone, that cortisol constantly is really going to have an effect on my body. So uh, I try to minimize that as much as possible. Um, I avoid eating under stress. I really try and calm down that nervous system so I can support my digestion, my absorption and my utilization of nutrients because you can have your food, but if you're not going to digest it and absorb it, you're not going to get the nutrients. So rest and digest is almost like my mantra. Uh, magnesium bath salts has really helped me in terms of relaxing uh, uh, muscle soreness and also that stress overall as well. In terms of my sleep quality, um, I try and implement uh, like an evening ritual, herbal tea, lavender spray, definitely some protein. And I've also tried to reintroduce recently meditation as well. And lastly, cold tart cherry extract juice, 20 minutes before bed. Now, it's, it's a way to stimulate that melatonin production. That's that sleep hormone, which is released by the brain when it gets dark and it's cold, and that's gonna help reduce the core temperature, body core temperature, so you're able to sleep at night. Um, so for me, it's about covering my bases first. The types of food, the specific nutrients, the specific exercise, minimizing the stress, increasing the fluid, and some form of sleep routine. For me, it's like, uh, it becomes a holistic approach for me. Wow, I want your life. I actually want to step into that life and I want to do all of that. <laughs> That's really interesting. I'm sure um, afterwards we'll be able to get some um, contact details, maybe have some information that you can um, give to people because it's a lot to take in there. It is, um, it is. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if you've, if you've pretty much covered all of the physical symptoms there, but um, I'm going to ask Steph anyway to um, if there's anything that sporty women can do to better manage the physical symptoms of peri and menopause through the sport, especially with cycling. I think you mentioned um, sort of uh, undercarriage issues and maybe there's things that we can do to cope with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. A, a couple of things I picked up on that I just wanted to say as well, I probably missed out when I was talking about HRT earlier. There is currently no arbitrary length of time that you should take HRT for or when you should stop it. If you are happy with the, with the risks and you've discussed them with your doctor and you come to an informed decision, then there's no reason why you shouldn't stay on HRT forever if that's what you want. Um, and also it's a bit of a myth that um, HRT delays menopause. It doesn't, your own hormones do their own thing in the background, they continue to decline. Um, and so when we stop um, HRT, we could get symptoms back in the short term. That's because we're withdrawing estrogen. However, if we tail down our HRT, then we're much less likely to experience those. Some women experience symptoms forever. Unfortunately, some women just do. Yeah. Okay, so the um, how to manage our symptoms. Well, um, obviously I'm quite a big advocate of HRT. I'm, I'm, adv I'm an advocate of choice, absolutely, an advocate of choice. However, being a user of HRT and seeing how it worked for me, then um, I think it's a bit of a no brainer really, but it's not for everybody, absolutely not. Um, it can really help with the joint and muscle pains. It can help to maintain muscle mass, along with obviously doing the weight bearing exercises and resistance training. Diet and lifestyle is always worth revisiting whenever um, we can. And menopause gives us a great opportunity because our life suddenly changes so much and it's a really good time to think about it. Uh, with regards to the um, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, so the, the symptoms that affect our labia, our vulva, 
um, and our urinary system and our vaginas, um, local estrogens are incredibly effective. They are a very, very, very small dose, a minute dose. If you were to use, um, for example, one of the pessaries that's on the market now twice a week for a year, it is the equivalent of using one normal HRT tablet. It is such a tiny dose. And it's also only absorbed locally. So it doesn't have a systemic effect. It won't have any effect on any of your other um, symptoms. And it's pretty much suitable for everybody. Very, very few women who actually can't use it. So just putting back that estrogen into the area that really needs it can really help to um, help the, the symptoms of the skin issues, the splitting and the soreness of the skin, the vaginal dryness, the um, urging continence that comes often comes along with it and the feelings of uh, cystitis or even the feelings of recurrent thrush, which actually normally isn't recurrent thrush at all. It's normally a symptom of um, a vaginal atrophy. Um, the... Um, there are lots of vaginal moisturizers available on the market. Some are better than others. Uh, and careful selection is required really. Not all those that are advertised on the TV are actually the best thing for you to be using. Um, and um, a little bit of we should stop me really. It's not normal, absolutely not normal. Seeing a women's health physio is definitely a good thing to do as well because they can assess and treat your pelvic floor appropriately, teach you how to do the appropriate pelvic floor exercises so you have uh, long-term continence. That's, that's really good. I mean, one of the issues I think a lot of women find is that they need to go for a pee a little bit more often. So I find that having sympathetic and empathetic friends around me when I need to stop mid-run or mid-cycle is always a good thing. Um, so the other thing that um, obviously there's the mental health side of the peri and menopause and um, Vicky has touched on this already, but it's um, helpful just to think of some ways that people can um, cope with the mental symptoms, especially if they're sporty. Is there anything that you would like to add or that we can do, do you think, Vicky? Yeah, of course. Um, I, th I think one of the first things to say is that, that women are naturally pretty good at organising things. So trying to keep a hold on that and trying to keep a handle on this when, when it feels as though you're losing in it is, is one of those sort of key issues. Um, it may have been the case that you were super organized and you managed to organize a lot of things in your head previously. Um, and certainly on, on a personal level, I found that just putting those things down, actually physically writing a list of those things rather than holding on to them into your head, which is where you'd previously had them, can be really helpful. Um, in your sporting life, you're probably fairly familiar with the idea that you should that you should have maybe some goals, some focus goals. Um, now, if, if you wanted to write sort of daily tasks down as goals, really simple things encompassing not only sport, general working and family bits and pieces and so on. Try not to separate these things out. These are all just part of you. You don't have to say, there's my sporting life. Here's my work life have lists that encompass you and your life and, and, and work your way through your lists in a day and try to organise your thoughts maybe a little bit better. One of the key issues, I think, in terms of uh, managing this, this change is to adjust your expectations. It was touched on earlier. Um, it helps you to become a bit more satisfied with your sporting achievements. It's not something you'll probably be able to do overnight, um, it will be a sort of period of adjustment where you realise um, that you still have this ability to achieve. You've still got what would be described as um, agency, the, the ability to achieve what you want, but it might just be in different ways. And depending on where your expectations are um, set, um, your sort of pre-menopausal sporting career and experiences um, you know, these, these might be very different for different women. So you might find that your shift is from winning at competitions to just competing. You might find that you've got a shift from competing to event participation. You might find that you go from event participation to social participation, and then ultimately into something that's just more like lifelong participation in sport, um, where maybe your, your involvement is even to do with volunteering, coaching, mentoring and, and so forth. Um, I think it's important to work out what makes you tick or if you're a coach, what makes your athlete tick? 
Um, if a woman's reason to participate or compete in sport changes, and that might be a feature of the menopause, it's it's fairly vital that you try and um, and sort of discuss this and find this out and also acknowledge it. So if winning is no longer the reason for you to participate, but enjoyment becomes the reason for you to participate or general fitness, adjusting to that change is really quite important. And then with the people you're working with, your coaches, your club mates, it's also important for them to understand this. Um, you know, if you're working out ways to feel good and still feel good or to enjoy different features about your sport, cycling in particular, in today's conversation, then you're still going to come out of it feeling, for example, satisfied, included, valuable. And those might be things like just actually becoming better at something and um, not necessarily faster. Um, you know, if you become more skillful um, or you learn a new skill, you maybe try some mountain biking. You've never tried it before. Um, I noticed somebody had actually popped a question up to do with cornering and feeling that their cornering and descending skills were, were sort of regressing somewhat. So taking some time over these things and actually practicing them and, and maybe going back to scratch maybe would be a way of dealing with that. Um, there are lots of other different ways of thinking about your sort of psychological health during menopause. But I do think that, um, for example, having a regular teammate or a training buddy, um, even working with people who are actually younger than you and less experienced than you to give them your experiences can be a really, really good way of helping you to feel valued um, if you are no longer the athlete that you used to be. Um, no, these are all these are great points. I'm really aware we've got a ton of questions God, um, coming in. So <laughs> I'm going to... Um, I'm going to round it up a little bit with a bit more of a positive takeaway from this topic because it all sounds quite doom and gloom, doesn't it? Although we have heard from people who are going through it and people who found methods, whether it's through nutrition or HRT or whatever. Um, and I want to ask each of the panel, I'm going to say as well, um, what my positive takeaway has been from the last, I guess, 10 years of this. And I still haven't come out the other end, by the way. Um, so mine is HRT. <laughs> as I said, I uh, found it a miracle treatment. It hasn't completely cured everything um, but it's helped a great deal and it's allowed me to continue with sport because it's allowed it's got rid of some of the symptoms that were stopping me um, and I also greatly value the friends that I've made and actually grown closer to through our shared experiences I'm really well known whether I'm with a group of men or women for just saying it how it is if I'm suffering with some sort of hot sweat or horrendous period pain or um, something to do with the menopause, I pretty much say it's anybody who's been out with me for a run or a bike ride, regardless of age or gender will have heard all about it. And I think that actually, I have discovered a new kind of outlet for my journalism and, and talking about things and it's been a really great experience. So that's been a positive for me. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of the panel just for a quick response to say a positive um, that's come out of the, the menopause for them. Let's start with Chris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, well, really, truly, um, I've really accepted my body the way it is now and trying to be in tune with my body. And I've taken this holistic view and also it's given me the opportunity to uh, reset and renew and rediscover, if you like, this new phase. But not only for now, but also for the future as well. That's Yeah, it's really positive. And Joyce. I think the fact that we're talking about it, I think for so many years you felt as if you were alone and you were going through all of this and you were, you were actually something mentally happening to you. I think the fact that we're now talking about it, talking about it openly, and that the young people coming, young ladies coming behind us will be much more prepared, hopefully, than we were. Brilliant. Uh, Fiona Walker. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Take yourself off. That's it. And following on from what Joy says, I think talking about it is so important. Anyone that knows me knows that I talk all the time. And when I was having hot flushes at work, I told everybody that walked in the door about my hot flushes. But it, what amazed me was the number of people who said, yeah, me too. And they might not have spoken about it if I hadn't just 
being the blunt, talkative person I am. And I think it's really good if we all talk about it because we can share different ways of coping. Yeah. What, Vicky, it's you're... Not a one sorry, size sorry, fits. sorry. It's not a one-size-fits-all, I yeah. think. Yeah. Vicky, you're, you're quick, positive. I know you're a bit pre-perimenopause. You're a bit at the other side, it, the beginning bit. You've got it all to come. Yeah, I think similar to, to some of the other ladies' experiences, um, I, I've sort of continued to spend time throughout both my sporting and sort of sporting social life um, with the same people. And it's the same women that I started my sporting life with. Probably Fiona and Joyce actually featuring <laughs> in there along the way. Um, now, knowing that those women um, are actually they have to be going through this, they can't not, it is actually a huge support. And these, my, my friends, myself, we don't, we don't meet to go to the shops. My God, no, we meet to go for a ride, a run, a swim, a walk. That remains the case. And knowing that those women are still there with me doing those things, however grumpy, hot, bothered, needing a wee, we happen to be need to being, it's, it's great to know they're still there with me doing it. Really nice one. And Steph, have you got a positive? I know you love your HRT. I absolutely well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, HRT was a real savior, as you found from you, was a real savior for me. Um, I think my main positive is that the, the pretty rough time I had has enabled me to be able, has, has put me in a position where I'm able to support other women and has quite frankly, frankly given me a whole new career. Yeah, yes, yes. So I'm just going to go through some questions. We've got some Q&As coming through now. We probably will run over, but just to say that this is being recorded and so you will be able to listen back if you have to leave because you've got to uh, rush off to pour yourself a massive glass of wine or whatever, or if indeed you haven't poured one already when we're at home. But I might need to at the end of this. But anyway, let's have a look at some of the questions that are coming in. Um, people are using the Q&A system. Um, they do seem to be using the chat and I've also got some actually on a WhatsApp thing coming through as well. So I'll start with this and let me see if we can find the right person to answer. So can, I think we may have touched on this obviously already, can the right training, this is from Lucy McTaggart, can the right training com combat the menopausal loss of muscle mass, which I think we have answered in terms of doing um, more strength and resistance. Uh, I think mm. we, uh, Chris answered that. Does anybody else want to add anything into that? Or is that, it's, it's about, doing uh, more of the sort of the strength and conditioning classes that you might have forgotten about in your 30s and 40s because you just cycle but um, building some of those in does anybody else want to say anything stick your hand up Vicky quick one yeah and Chris touched on it as well it's it's just a bit a bit of impact work you, you need to have that little bit of impact work for your 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 bones to to maintain stimulus and to be to be keeping supporting you the yeah, and it's not about lifting cycling, massive yeah. weights yeah it's... no and but cycling doesn't provide that and it's really important that if you want to keep cycling you do still need to have impact work like you're saying if it's if it's been phased out get it back in yeah yeah and there's lots of classes you can find loads of them online as well so this is coming in from sue i'm 60 and still having regular periods how common is this steph do you know Oh, I wouldn't know how common it is. No, but it's not it's not entirely uncommon as you're finding so. Um hopefully it will all tail off for you soon. I know. Well my mother who's in her mid seventies tells me that she still gets hot flushes, which really, really worries me. Um she That's says they're not as much. Common. Yeah, yeah. So some symptoms maybe do continue. Uh Another Sue is saying, does HRT prolong the symptoms? But we've heard from Steph that actually it shouldn't because the uh the hormones should be reducing in the background anyway. It's just that when you come off, uh, that if you come off too quickly, that you can get some of the symptoms back. Although Joyce might want to add something there because she's done this. Yeah, I, th I think the, the key thing is to listen to Steph and, and realise that the doctors in a lot of the surgeries don't have a really great knowledge about menopause and maybe to seek out more people because I gave up very easily. I would have loved to have stayed on the HRT, but they had me terrified that if I stayed on it too long, it was going to have a, a major issue for me. So I think you take more advice on that. And if you can stay on it, stay on it. But it's, it's certainly, I think I've been given the wrong uh, information along the way. 
yeah, there's a growing body of evidence, as Steph is saying, that um, you can stay on HRT, because certainly when yeah. I started, I was told only a couple of years, and I've been on it much longer than that now. Uh, from Corinne, we've got a question. Does any, do, do, does any, do any of you have any experience or come across women with a contraceptive implant which stops periods altogether? Make, does it make it much harder to diagnose perimenopause or menopause? Um, maybe that's referring to the marina coil. Um, mm. So I guess that when you do have the coil, uh, or in fact, yeah, if you have got the marina coil, which is the progesterone, then it does mask some of the symptoms. Fiona, do you want to, to say something yeah. about that? You might have been talking about the contraceptive implant that you get put into your arm. Oh, okay. Yes, I've forgotten about those. Yeah. Steph? Yeah, the contraceptive implant and the myrena coil are progesterone and the symptoms are caused by lack of estrogen. So you would probably still be getting the symptoms as you're going through perimenopause, but not everyone does. The only thing you won't know is when your period's finished because they're being artificially stopped by having the progesterone. Yeah. Anecdotally, a lot of my friends who've had the marina coil, the progesterone one, um, seem to suffer some less symptoms of um the menopause but that's totally anecdotal and i can't understand why that would be um because it is to do with estrogen um has anybody got any views on whether ectopic heartbeats can be linked to perimenopause steph <laughs> certainly are yes palpitations certainly are yep and, and for very many women estrogen helps yeah yeah so yes, you probably would want to seek some um, advice on that from your GP or um, a menopause consultant, or in fact, uh, drop a line to the menopause um, support network because they're always very helpful. Uh, another question here. I feel like this is like some sort of, uh, <laughs> you've got to press a button, a buzzer to answer. What happens when you come off HRT? Is it gradually reduced and are there side effects? Again, we have touched on this. Um, so Steph, give us a quick overview of that. When, if you choose to stop, you don't have to stop. If you choose to stop, or if there's some medical reason for you to stop, you should reduce the dose down slowly. You shouldn't just stop cold turkey. I mean, you can go cold turkey. There's no danger in doing it at all, except that you are likely to get some symptoms of estrogen withdrawal, but they should be short-lived. If you tailor your um, estrogen down slowly, then you're much less likely to get withdrawal symptoms. Okay, um, I've got a question here. I'm getting a message from um, those behind the scenes in Scottish Cycling that we will be going over, but um, we'll probably do an article because we've got tons of questions here. And what we might do is we'll take lots of these questions and we'll uh, do an article on the website to answer some of them. But on here, on um, this has come through the YouTube. Um, I'm being hit at all sides with messages here. This one says, HRT won't be possible for some people, particularly if they've had breast cancer. Um, that was hormone responsive, perhaps that medical, medical information has changed, but has, was it, it wasn't the case for me. Has that medical information changed or is it in fact still the case? Do you want me to come in on that one? Yes, yeah, Steph, please. Very much an individual thing. And uh, if someone's had an, an estrogen receptive breast cancer in the past, then if they want to try some um, HRT because their symptoms are troubling them so much, it's very much an individual thing. And what we would recommend in menopause support is that you ask for referral to a menopause specialist because they are much better placed to deal with more complex cases and much better able to help you. Ultimately, there was some research, there was a, a guideline issued by the General Medical Council back in November last year about um, decision making and consent. And decisions made about your health are to be made jointly between doctors and you. You, you, you have a say in what happens to your body. So Basically, it, it's down to having informed decisions with someone who knows what they're talking about. OK, that's good. Maybe we've got time for another couple of questions. I am very aware that a chap, a, co a coach from Revolution Velo Coaching called Callum O'Connor, he did also write in with a question way before any of you came in. But it's quite a complicated question. I think it's probably one of those ones that would be better placed to answer um, after this um, is to do with coaching. And it is really interesting, but it's quite scientific. Um, so somebody's asking... Um, at what stage of the perimenopause can one go on to HRT? Um, I would say at any stage, if the symptoms are um, bothering you, then it doesn't really matter what your age is. Um, some people in their 30s go on to it. There will be doctors um, who will tell you that you're not allowed or not able to go on it um, until you're in your 50s. Uh, but actually what you need to do is try and find a GP that will. Steph will tell you about that. 
if you go through perimenopause and menopause at an earlier age, it's very, very important that you do have some estrogen. Because most women have the protection of estrogen up until the age of 51, which is just the normal average age of menopause. But for women who go through it much earlier, it's, it's quite important that they do have it just to protect their bones and their hearts. Another quick question. What are the views on the different estrogen formulations, say gel, spray, patches and tablets? Um, as we've discussed already, uh, it, the best ones are the ones that go onto the skin. Um, so the, the gels and the patches, the tablets are the ones that eat. some people do need to take the tablets because they don't get on with. Well, anyway, I'll let Steph describe this one because she's more medically sound than I am. <laughs> but I think that's a general overview. The, the best ones to take are the ones that are going to fit in with your lifestyle that you take. Gold standard is all about what fits for you, basically. There may well be a medical gold standard, but if that doesn't fit with your lifestyle and your routine, then it won't work for you. So the best to take is the one that works for you. So patches are a twice weekly product. You put them on and change them twice a week. And gels and sprays are a once daily product. So it's whichever fits with you, really. The active ingredient, estrogen in all of them, is the same. It's the 17 beta estradiol. OK, maybe one last question here, I think, because we've got on to, I don't know, people might want to stay and enjoy it even more. But this actually does touch on what the um, Callum O'Connor was asking as a coach. Are there um, any training tips for women in perimenopause, especially those trying to follow a periodized program? Now, I know Vicky's got this. I think she wants to comment on this. Yeah, um, as, as Fiona mentioned, Callum had put a, a question to us um, behind the scenes, and um, I, I think I think the the, the sort of main um, outcome from this would, would be to, to if, if you're looking at women who are experiencing fluctuations in their menstrual cycles, um, a traditional periodized training cycle sort of program simply won't work. Your cycle no longer exists menopause is is that it's stopping of the cycle so the cycle is no longer there so trying to follow either a woman's cycle as it used to be with regard to periodization of their training program um, or your training program um, is just not going to work anymore um, and you, you can't just try and railroad a periodized program over the top of what's happening to you it's, it's incredibly important that during this phase, um, while there's all this disruption, you've got intermittent cycles, you might have bleeding, all sorts of distressing sort of uh, symptoms, that listening to your athlete, listening to yourself and uh, responding to those things is critical to how you actually behave during your, your training. Now, that might mean that you have three weeks where you have close to no training, but followed by six week where you have a really, really sort of stable phase of training. Um, the, the notion of, of periodization, albeit that we're talking about periods in a different sort of um, context, um, just doesn't work anymore. I'm, I'm really sorry to say, but it doesn't. <laughs> You've just got to oh, listen. I, I'm going to, I really do want to mention this one. This, this has come in. So it's quite nice. Maybe this is the way to, um, to finish, I, I've sort of read it, so I'm hoping that it's what I think it is. So somebody said, um, I've been cycling since I was 18. I'm now 57 and started TT time trial racing again when I was 47. By the time I was 50, I was faster than when I was 18, which is wonderful. Menopause actually started at 48. My main issue is still I have hot flushes, mainly at night, up during the night constantly for the toilet. Retired as a police officer three years ago. They allowed me to stop night shifts a year, a year prior to retiring as I was absolutely shattered doing the night shifts. My mother had an awful menopause. I have never suffered from the depression, but do have aches and pains. I'm still cycling, but my motivation is not what it was. But I really like that she has much faster than when she was 18. That's such a positive. And I do know women who are still getting amazing PBs. I mean, I know a woman, same age as me, who I went to school with and who manages to do a sub three hour marathon, which is astounding. And that these people are amazing. But I mean, most of us do need to, uh, reassess where we're at and what our enjoyment is and what our enjoyment in sport is. I'm so grateful to all of the panel um, for, for giving us their personal information and stories and also their expertise. You've all been really amazing. And it's such a fascinating discussion. I'm so pleased I started writing about it when it happened to me because it's been able, it's allowed me to be able to share my own experiences and those of so many women. 
There is going to be a follow up. Um, I'm not sure what format, but there'll be articles and links to all the resources that will help women um, through Scottish Cycling. So we'll make sure that goes out to everybody. Um, and it's been fantastic to have so many people attending and every one of you, if you can share the information with others, it means that men and women um, of all ages will have a greater understanding of the perimenopause and the menopause and hopefully we can all have a much happier and more enjoyable sporty life going forward. So thank you all. Thank you.